Hey guys, welcome back to Airplane Anatomy, a series where I break down various different airplanes by their engineering, their history, and the physics behind how they fly. So today in episode two, we're going to talk about the Supermarine Spitfire. Now this plane is probably no stranger to a lot of you guys. It's one of the most iconic war planes from World War II that was eventually adopted by 32 different countries, and even today is still loved and flown around the world. However, it wasn't always this way. It actually had a very turbulent start with all sorts of engineering and production and design issues. So today we're going to get into those and also talk about how the Spitfire managed to overcome those obstacles to become the icon that it is today. So let's get started. The story of the Spitfire begins with its creator, a man by the name of R.J. Mitchell. Now, Mitchell was a chief designer at a company called Supermarine Aviation Works, which was a British company that produced a range of different seaplanes. Around 1933, Mitchell was actually diagnosed with cancer and decided to move abroad to Germany for his treatment. And while in Germany, Mitchell attended various air shows where he saw the rapid aviation developments of a country that would soon to become Nazi Germany. So Mitchell soon realized that against these new aircrafts, Britain would essentially become defenseless in the air. Now he wasn't the only one who realized this because back in 1930, the Air Ministry of Britain actually issued a request for a new type of airplane that would be able to sustain flight at 250 miles per hour while carrying four machine guns. And this was to replace their existing fleet of the Gloucester Gauntlet. So against the advice of his doctors, Mitchell and his team of engineers got to work around the clock designing a new plane. The first design that Mitchell came up with was an aircraft by the name of Supermarine Type 224. Now the 224 was a spectacular failure. Uh, it had an open cockpit with bulky, heavy wings that basically failed every single evaluation by the air ministry. So instead the contract was given to the Gloucester Gladiator. However, Mitchell did learn from his mistakes and decided to basically replace every single component on the 224 in order to create a new aircraft called the Supermarine Type 300. This new Type 300 aircraft featured retractable landing gear, a closed cockpit system with oxygen supply, and smaller and much thinner wings, and overall just much better design. So this is starting to resemble the Spitfire that we recognize today. Now this actually caught the attention of the air ministry, so in December of 1936, they actually placed an order for 310 of these Type 300 aircrafts at a price of 1.4 million pounds each, or in today's money, 99 million pounds. As Britain approached World War II, they realized that the biggest threat from Germany was going to be their bombers. They knew that the single-engine fighter aircrafts from Germany did not have the range to fly over the North Sea in order to reach Britain. So for that reason, even though the Spitfire is a fighter aircraft, it was never designed to engage in dogfight with other fighters, but instead its design goal was to climb as quickly as possible in order to intercept these bomber planes and deal damage. Now of course this changed later on as Germany went on to invade northern France and started taking off their fighters from there. So in that regard, the Spitfire was actually forced to engage in dogfight later on with other fighter aircrafts, and this actually explains the performance disadvantage that they had during those dogfights later on. So in its design, the engineers decided to use a semi-monocoque method. Now at the time, it was very popular to use a monocoque method to construct the fuselage, where basically you have a skin that is supporting the weight of the entire structure. So think of the structure of an aluminum can. Now obviously this is very lightweight and efficient and strong, however, it had very weak points and was very prone to damage, especially with more weight. So in order to combat this problem, the engineers started adding basically a backbone of structure to support the skin additionally uh, using various structures called stringers and frames. Now of course today we know that most jetliners actually adopt this semi-monocoque method as well because of how much weight it can sustain. 
Another innovative feature on this new aircraft was retractable landing gears, and of course this was to help reduce drag during flight. However, this was so new at the time that a lot of pilots allegedly forgot to lower the landing gear before touching down. Of course, the Spitfire is most known for its iconic elliptical wing. Now, this was very innovative for its time and chosen because it solved two conflicting requirements. One was that the wing needed to be very thin in order to be aerodynamic, but at the same time, it needed to be thick enough to store ammunition underneath. Engineers also found that an elliptical wing was the optimal shape in order to optimize the lift to drag ratio. However, there is a reason that we don't see a lot of elliptical wings today, and that is because it stalls at the wing tips first. Now, the reason why this is dangerous is because if you think of an airplane in level flights, when one of the airplane at the wing tips actually starts dropping, it enters the airplane into a very violent roll. Uh, now, of course, if both wing tips started to stall at the exact same time, the airplane would still maintain level flight. However, that is very unlikely. So it actually became a common case where the Spitfire would uh, drop on one side of its wing, enter into a spin, and be very hard to recover from. Now you might be wondering, what is the difference between the elliptical and the rectangular wing that makes it so easy for it to stall wingtip first? Well, that is because the angle at which a surface stalls is dependent on its surface area, or in this case, the width of the wing at that point, called a cord. Now, of course, as you can see on an elliptical wing, the cord gets drastically smaller as you approach the wing tips, whereas on the rectangular wing, the cord remains constant throughout. Additionally, elliptical wings are just more difficult to manufacture because of the different curvature. Now, this is the reason why we don't see a lot of elliptical wings today. the plane ran into yet more problems on the production line. At the time, Supermarine was actually a relatively small company that was already committed to producing multiple other seaplanes. On top of that, they initially agreed to subcontract to external companies the production of many of the important subcomponents. However, once production was supposed to begin, the company was reluctant to give out the actual blueprints to other companies. So because of this and many different other factors, almost two years later from the order being placed in 1934, production still hasn't started yet. At this point, the air ministry had growing concerns about Supermarine and actually wanted to end their contract after the initial 310 planes. However, by some skill, Supermarine was actually able to convince the air ministry that these problems would eventually be solved and instead convince them to purchase 200 more Spitfires before production even began. Now that is some incredible marketing. Finally, production started in 1936, and in March, the very first Spitfire took to the skies for the first time for a flight of eight minutes. Now, this was only four months after the Hurricane took its maiden flight, and the Hurricane was another famous British warplane from World War II as well. And over the years, as the success of the Spitfire grew, so did their main factory. That is, until 1940, when they were so successful that German bombers decided to bomb the factory and killed multiple experienced workers as well as destroyed the plant. So after that, they decided to move production to many smaller factories spread around the country. Another fun fact, allegedly the name Spitfire didn't come from combat but was actually the nickname of the daughter of the chairman of the production plant. Now that is a very wholesome origin story for a badass plane. After the Spitfire entered service in 1938, it quickly started to demonstrate its value in the skies. And throughout its lifetime, it had two main rivals. The first was the fighter aircraft from Nazi Germany called the Messerschmitt BF-109E. And the second was in the Pacific, the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M-0. The Spitfire was actually continually improved until its very last production in 1948. Now during this time, especially during the Battle of Britain, the Spitfire went head to head with the German BF 109. Now the Spitfire actually had a higher max speed as well as a faster rate of climb than the BF 109. However, it had one fatal weakness and that was it could not perform dives or barrel rolls. Now of course, this weakness the Germans soon exploited. 
the reason why the Spitfire couldn't perform those maneuvers was because of the flow of fuel into the carburetor, which is a chamber in the engine that mixed fuel and air in preparation for combustion. Now normally, there is a notch in the flow chamber before the carburetor which regulates the amount of fuel that actually enters the carburetor. When the plane starts flying upside down or inverted, first the fuel gets pushed to the top of the chamber, meaning that it can't actually reach the carburetor, and hence the engine becomes fuel starved. At the same time, as the plane is flying inverted, the notch actually gets pushed down, allowing more fuel than necessary to go into the chamber. Now, as a result, when the plane starts flying upright again, all of those excess fuel flows into the carburetor and floods the engine, essentially causing a stall. Now, this problem was actually fixed with a surprisingly simple solution, and that was adding a brass ring before the notch so that at any time, only the maximum amount of fuel needed is allowed to pass through. In the Pacific, the Spitfire also went head-to-head -head with the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M0. Now, the Spitfire actually had a slightly higher max speed as well as higher max altitude than the Zero. However, the Zero's advantage was that it was highly maneuverable with a lower stall speed, meaning it could uh, perform very tight turns without stalling and maintaining control. In addition, the Zeros had a much better acceleration than the Spitfires, which gave it a really great advantage under fire. This also meant that it was very dangerous for Spitfires to be caught cruising slowly because that meant they couldn't escape the range of fire from the Zero. To account for this, Spitfire pilots actually used a strategy called slash and dash where they used their advantage in diving and speed in order to sneak up on their enemy and uh, quickly fly away afterwards to avoid engaging in direct dogfighting. However, the small combat disadvantage of the Spitfire was still reflected in the statistics where it was found that 12% of Spitfires who engaged in battle with Zeros were eventually shot down, whereas the loss rates due to Spitfires of the Japanese Zeros was only 5%. After production stopped in 1948, there were a total of over 20,000 Spitfires produced from various different variants. Uh, so this made it actually the seventh most produced plane in the world today. In addition to that, during and after World War II, uh, the Spitfire was not only a fighter aircraft, but also served as a photo reconnaissance aircraft as well as a trainer. So if you're interested in photo reconnaissance aircraft, I actually did an airplane anatomy of the SR-71 uh, Blackbird in episode one, so go check that out when you're done with this video. Eventually, there was actually a naval variant made of the Spitfire called the Seafire that was made to land on aircraft carriers. Now, the interesting thing about its design was that the visibility over the nose was so bad that pilots actually had to stick their heads out the side of the cockpit in order to see the carrier that they were landing on, uh, which is a pretty funny anecdote. Of course, you can find Spitfires around various museums today, but there are actually still 60 airworthy Spitfires around the world that can still fly. And there are actually commercial companies where you can pay to get a ride in a Spitfire for the low price of $3,500. Thanks so much for making it to the end of this video. What did you think? Did you learn something new about the Spitfire you didn't know before? Uh, leave in the comments below any aircrafts that you want me to cover in the upcoming weeks. Uh, and of course, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel. And as always, I'll see you next week.